Welcome to the Academy of Esports podcast. I'm your host, James O'Hagan. I'm here with Jay Collins. Jay is a teacher at Hathaway Brown in Cleveland, Ohio, and also a former Department of Education liaison. Oh, gosh. I, you know what? We even checked it out beforehand. Could you please tell t- people what, what your role was with the Department of Education? I'm sorry, Jay. Sure. Yeah, I used to be a liaison for educational technology for the Office of the Secretary at the U.S. Department of Education. And there are lots of acronyms for that, too, but that's what it is all spelled out. Perfect. Perfect. I, I'm, I'm glad you, you said that, because if I had pulled that off, I would have... I don't know how, how much further we could have gone in the interview, because I think I would have used all my brain power for that one. But that's that's the way it is when I tell people my... When they ask me what my job is, I say, I'm the Director of Digital Virtual Learning, Libraries, and the Esports Czar. So that kind of is a, a lot to, to say. So, uh, Jay, thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, we met at the ISTE conference and we chatted a little bit at the ISTE conference. Um, your role, I think, at the Department of Education stems into what we're going to talk about today, which is your, your, your school of Hathaway Brown being the first all-girls school in the United States to offer a varsity esports program. But how do you go from working from the Department of Education to Hathaway Brown to saying, hey, we need to have programming that's specific to girls at our school in esports? I think at the Department of Education, we were always looking to get voices from the ground, uh, voices from teachers, voices from students, voices from administrators. Uh, There's actually some really interesting teacher fellowship programs at the Department of Education, and we often had students out, but it's not the same as being in the classroom, right? Mm -hmm. And so the longer that you're there working in an office, the longer that you're away from a classroom. I've taught before, I've taught after school, I've taught in museums, I've taught at the university level, but I hadn't taught day to day in a K-12 environment. And so when I came out of the Department of Education um, and decided to move to Cleveland, I started looking around and found that Hathaway Brown um, had a position open for someone who might be from the industry, might be interested in innovative ideas, was looking to kind of re-envision computer science education for them. That sounded like something that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, And in particular, I was really interested in taking all of the best practices, all of the lessons learned, all of the conversations I'd had at the department and also in my former job at the Smithsonian, where we used to host the National Teachers of the Year Award, um, and taking all those ideas and bringing it to that school and seeing, would they work? And so um, with all of the support, with this amazing school, with an amazing CIO um, and some awesome technology, I found that the policy recommendations that we were making, the practical recommendations, a lot of them worked. And guess what? Some of them didn't work either. And so finding ways to take our kind of like best practices and making them work in the classroom um, in a way that was sustainable and really modified for our own students. It's been a really interesting challenge um, and one that I think has expanded a lot on the way that I, I view education and games in classrooms. And it, it makes it, it is not it is not a small thing, too, because um, your story was first uh, uh, put out by the Associated Press, but picked up by The Washington Post and The New York Times. So this is kind of a major story. But your your attempt to engage your student population is very different than how many um I guess uh, esports programs in high schools, in particular, have tried to engage their students, where many of them are focused so much on the games and saying, "Okay, we we need to look at League of Legends and Overwatch." You started to kind of look at that route, but then things kind of morphed very quickly in that sense. Yes. Yeah. So we actually started by coming in. I came in that September, um, just out of right new new high school teacher orientation and uh, put out a call to my students and to all of our upper school students. We have about 400 um, girl and trans identifying students in our school. And out of those 400, we really only had about two who played League of Legends, which was which is probably the most popular title at, at the high school level right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and that to me made it sound like maybe that's the wrong question to be asking, right? If I ask 400 of our students and, and I, don't get a, I don't get a loud response back, um, I think a simplistic view there could be that we didn't have gamers, but I knew that wasn't the case, right? Because I was teaching computer science and I was teaching game design at the school and I knew that we had gamers. Um, so that really was an indicator that we had the wrong question. So Mm -hmm. we just tried modifying that question and seeing like, what question would it, would we need to ask to get people through the doors? I think a lot of schools actually start with the, the students who are already there, Mm -hmm. the students who are already showing up for, 
game class or for your game club or something like that. And um, that can be great for those students. But if you want different students in the door, um, I think you have to find what what question, right? You can't just stay within those four walls. Yeah. So uh, recently I did an interview with Dr. Chris Haskell and his approach was, was again, one of the two big things was we want to add, be able to add more chairs, meaning we want to make sure we give a broad experience to everybody. So we're not just focusing on the six or five uh, students and their game experience and focusing on that, but we want to have other avenues and opportunities for, for our kids to participate. Um, and, and then also trying to decide early on, what do you want your student group to look like? Um, because a lot of people don't think about that. They, even recently, there's been some organizations and groups that have popped up who have come to prominence in the news, whether they're because they're starting a tournament or because they're starting an association. And I look at the body of people who are involved with it, predominantly male, predominantly white, um, not a lot of female voice in the space, especially at the high school level. So uh, I guess what was the question then that you shifted to and how did you go about getting the answers to the question to arrive at the conclusions that you did with your program? Yeah, I think one of the fun things that I did was actually every student who came into my classroom, I asked them to write games that they play up on the board. And we tried, we didn't put any names next to it. We said it was a no judgment zone. You know, if, um, if you, you know, if you play candy crush and that's all that you play, guess what? That's fine. Right. Write it up there. So, um, so we did that and collected maybe 20 or so, uh, different games that students were playing. And some of those had, you know, 15 check marks next to it. Some of those people really felt like they had to put up there, even though they didn't play them. That was kind of a weird phenomenon. Um, almost everyone who came in said, well, games, I hear League of Legends, right? But we had to drill down on that. Do you actually play it? Mm-hmm. Have you just heard of it, right? Um, we got a lot of Nintendo games up there. Um, we had a lot of single player games up there. And I don't think that if we had just been asking, hey, what esports game do you want to play? I don't think we would have gotten that robust set of data of like, these are this is a better picture of what our students are playing. Mm-hmm. Um, but by taking down some of those like initial filters, we saw that like, these, these, these girls um, and other students at our school, they are gamers, right? Um, they may not be playing Rocket League. They may not be playing League of Legends, but they play games, and um, they should be validated for that. And did any of the issues around some of the gaming companies and their, I guess you could say, very public toxic cultures come into the conversation at all when, when these games came up? You know, I don't think that that came up from the students immediately. Um, Many of them don't follow um, particular streamers, um, and a lot of them aren't reading the game news media. Um, The the most reactions that I would see would come when a game got pulled up, right? So like, um, you know, uh, a game might load and uh, there is no option for uh, a a student to play as a female character. Mm -hmm. That's a flag for them, right? Um, or maybe the only female character in there is, um, you know, doesn't doesn't look or feel the way that they feel they want to be represented. And so um, you could see the interest level just kind of drop on some of those. Um, a lot of that conversation we actually had in our game design class because we actually have a game design class as well. And so we would take apart some of these um, these social and cultural indicators in games um, and look at them in more depth. Um, watch feminist frequency and some other um, some other uh, uh, analysts like that to to take a look at like why don't we feel a connection to particular games? Um, an interesting story actually. I put uh, Forza on for some of our students to play, and I asked them, you know, have you ever played a racing game? And they're like, no, we don't. <laughs> that's not that's not for us. Um, and then one one girl was like, well, I play Mario Kart. Does that count? I'm like, of course that counts. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, we all play racing games. I showed them Forza and they were like, this is not for us. Like, we're just not, not interested. Um, and I gave the controller to one of the girls and um, maybe 10, 15 minutes later, they all wanted to play it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, because it's fun to drive really fast, crash into trees and, um, and win, right? Uh, but they they just had that initial filter of like, this isn't for us. Um, and it wasn't until we got past that that we started to see, hey, we can have fun in lots of different ways through games. And I was talking to a gentleman also at the SD conference who relayed a story to me, talking to a group of girls as well, too, at, at his school. And he indicated that um, when he brought up the idea of having a gaming club, 
the girls were a little apprehensive and even questioned it because they said there were no boys. You know, how are we going to have one if we don't have any boys? Did you get that sense too from the girls with which I know that an all female or all girls school is going to have a different perspective sometimes, but did you yeah, get, no, did, did you get no that way. sense as well too, that, Oh, how are we going to do this if we don't have boys involved? No, no way. Not at all. Okay, um, good. I think they're all really used to that. So, um, there's this identity at Hathaway Brown that like, there is nothing that a girl doesn't do. Right. Like, um, you, when you look at class president, it's not a surprise when it's a girl, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's almost always a girl. Um, there isn't a surprise when you walk into your computer science classroom or your engineering classroom and see a bunch of other girls, because guess what? You, you belong there. Mm -hmm. Um, our robotics team, which is the only, um, uh, robotics team from an all girls school in the region. Um, again, you know, everybody's using power drills and lathes and things much sharper than I would usually use um, out of concerns for my safety. So, um, <laughs> there is no, there, that one of the beautiful things I think about our school is that that just doesn't, that thought doesn't, doesn't hit them. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is, this is meant for us. So if we start a gaming club, guess what? It's our gaming club. And the great thing though, is you took this gaming club that you have, you turned it into a, did, did going from club to varsity experience, because that was the title of the headline. And, and some people, kind of confuse, I guess, the two because, um, you know, they, they just think because you have a team, it automatically becomes varsity. But in I know in my school district, for example, how things are funded are based off of the, what they're associated with. So varsity coaching is going to have a very different funding source than, say, a club is going to have and vice versa. Did you have to have those conversations with your school leadership to to say, hey, we want to take this to the next level? We want to formalize this as a varsity level experience? You know, it actually went the other way it went in oh, reverse really? yeah so when they when they hired me um and i brought up esports they're like you know what we want to see if this if this can work um because so our our um athletic team name is the blazers because hb is a trailblazer and so when i was like this would be a new experience and i don't know if it will work or not um they're like well hey we're the trailblazers right let's do it and see and so um, so we actually started with that. We started with, uh, formal practices and we started with recruiting for the team and, um, you know, applications and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and then there was so much interest, particularly after the season started or stopped. Um, the, the students were like, well now what, because the season's over. And I said, you could still come and play games. And so they did. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they were showing up, um, once, twice, sometimes three times a day. Um, and our, 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 the interest actually grew from the, the core of students that were there to, I don't know, 15 students, right. Showing up at, at 10 AM to play two rounds of smash brothers before they went off to their next class. So, um, I'm really excited actually to see what happens next year because we, we have kind of a game lab set up now, which we didn't have last year oh, um, cool. in as much of a formal way. And, um, and we have kind of this uh, social network of students who feel welcome into that space. And so I think we're just going to keep growing in interest from here. And and what I love about what you just described, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I heard you say, you're now you're, you've developed kind of a gaming lab space. And you had students coming in there, not necessarily in the formal times when you're supposed to be there, but also in the informal times. So you've given students an actual place to play inside the school, outside of, say, a playground or a gymnasium or a place where people run around necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, two big screen TVs and a projector, mm -hmm. and we have a variety of consoles there. So we have an Xbox, we have um, uh, a couple Nintendo Switches, we have some retro consoles, actually. And we use those now double purpose, double purpose for folks to come in and play, uh, but also in some of our game design classes to look at how games have progressed uh, over time. Um, our students come by during lab, during lunch, during study halls, free periods. Um, actually some of our com students commute quite a ways. Um, we've had students commute from as far away as an hour and a half, two hours, um, because of the special nature of our school. Okay. And so when they're hanging out, um, I mean, I used to see some of these students, right. Sitting in a hallway, just kind of like playing on their phone or playing on their switch by themselves. And now they're in this gaming lab, lab, hanging out with other students playing together. It's, it's, it's built a lot of new friendships actually. And, and I've seen, too, you're kind of taking a, a university perspective. I know that there's some universities who say, no, we have our gaming arena and that's for our our teams. But 
a school, say, for example, now much bigger budget, of course, but like the University of Washington, which set up a very public gaming lab space uh, for their all entire student body to use as well as their esports competitors. Northern Illinois University actually set up one on campus inside one of their dorms, and then they've set up two at uh, two of their off-site satellite campuses to allow any student to come in and have that game experience. We know that even as we get older, the importance of play doesn't diminish. It just changes or, or maybe our medium that we use kind of changes. So it's important that, that you are giving these uh, students, you have uh, a space for them to still honor that importance of play. Yeah, I, I hate gatekeeping. I just think it's the worst thing in the world, especially when it's applied to games. I think that if someone if someone has fun and there's play involved, then what does it matter if it's this game or that game or played in this place or that place? I think the important part is that that connection that occurs between people. Mm -hmm. um, and if that connection is happening, that's a lot more important than whatever is happening in the game. And so we talk a lot about the magic circle, which is a game design term. Um, you know, everything within the magic circle, the rules are different here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sometimes really hard to kind of pierce that membrane in a school setting. <clears throat> there are so many rules and formal structures. Um, you have to raise your hand. You have to wait in line. You have to do that, this and that. It makes it hard to enter into that magic circle and say, hey, here's a place where we can be playful and have fun. And so often what I'm talking about with my students is how do we grow that magic circle, right? So it's not just the person who has a controller, but the people who are around that person, um, the people in the classroom, maybe even the school culture. How do we grow that so that we can infuse more playfulness and fun into into every day? And, and I like, too, the, the, the magic circle concept. I mean, that's when I oversee libraries, that's kind of what we're hoping that our libraries are. And they don't always fall into that. There's still some people who want to keep our libraries museums rather than I, I like to call our libraries marketplaces where there's activity, there's noise. You know, when you think of a marketplace, there's a lot of movement in there. Um, and then again, like I said, the more traditional sense of a library is a museum, a mausoleum, if you will, for books, um, which is not what we want it to be. And I've tried to connect esports into um, our library spaces. You actually have developed some interesting relationships with libraries as part of your league because, you know, you talked about some of the games or the games you're not playing. The games that you are playing, though, are not your traditional, I guess you could say, collegiate track uh, esports games. But you've developed a really neat um, group, uh, a league, if you will, of other schools and libraries with which you're playing. One of them being the Cleveland Public Library. Is that correct? Yeah, the Cleveland Public Library and I had uh, conversations uh, last fall, actually, because they had been doing some really advanced and interesting esports work that maybe they hadn't gotten enough credit for. Um, because really, it's it's an amazing program, um, and unlike a lot of others in the in the nation, and so. Um, uh, the, their person running that over there, Tristan and I got to talking and he said, you know, anything that the Cleveland public library can do to develop stronger relationships with schools, particularly around esports, it's win-win, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because again, games bring people together. So, um, I, I used to, at the U S department of education, I used to work, um, to some extent with libraries, with my colleague, Sarah Tretton. Um, we did a lot with future ready librarians, um, and we were looking for ways to, to put some game based education competencies, um, to attach to that. Um, we actually hosted a conference libraries, games and play last spring, where we talked uh, a lot about exactly that. How do we take some of these 21st century learning skills, um, and frameworks and connect them to game based education? Cause there's, there's a lot of overlap there, but I have to, I have to say one thing, um, hmm. since I also did used to work in museums and. Museums should not be mausoleums, right? <laughs> um, so we, um, right after I left the Smithsonian, um, we actually were able to host a first, our first esports tournament at the Smithsonian. Really? Yeah. Yeah. When, yeah. when, when, when approximately was this? Oh, gosh. Um, this was at the tail end of the Obama administration. Okay. So, so this would have been um, around 2012-ish? Something like no, that. No, wait. That, he was here until 2006. Gosh. I'm, yeah, that was yeah, the yeah, first yeah. administration. So 2016-ish. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, we had the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Um, we had uh, an NBA, I think it was NBA 2K set up with Boys and Girls Club of America, and we had them playing right next to art. Um, and I think that that's a beautiful model for museums. You say we don't want to make libraries like museums. I actually say I don't want to make museums like warehouses, because I think too often that's what it turns into. It's like, here's an object in a glass case with a little number in it, under it. That provides them nothing to no one, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe to the art student who comes by and is like, hey, I read about this in a book. 
But for your average visitor who comes in, you need that cultural engagement, you need that excitement. And I think there are a ton of ways for schools, libraries, museums, informal and formal education to work together to bring that through about. And I think a lot of it starts with games and, and again, expanding that magic circle. And I think warehouse is a more appropriate term than museum. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, because I've been to the no. Smithsonian and the Smithsonian experience is unlike, <laughs> yeah, the Smithsonian is something completely, uh, all of the museums on that campus are, are completely uh, interactive and fun and unique. But yes, a warehouse of books is the thing we're trying to avoid. And, and I, I think that esports does have a space uh, in our public library system, especially when uh, for example, in my in my hometown, Racine, Wisconsin, and we have the gaming lounge. But even the gaming lounge, which is a space anybody can walk to, can be intimidating for some people, whether they're adults or they're children or girls or even young boys who, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily walk into the space. They don't want to feel ignorant, I guess you could say. They don't want to walk into their feeling necessarily ignorant, so they, maybe they feel that there's a... Uh, an intimidation to it, but having the public library now stepping into the spaces we're trying to do here in Racine, I think is going to open a lot more doors to people who maybe have stereotypical feelings about gaming. Is there, or was there as part of your league experience? And this was a question asked to me today when I was telling them, Hey, I was going to be interviewing Jay Collins. Here's a story. And she asked, did any of the girls feel any kind of intimidation or apprehension when they were going up against any teams with boys? Um, I think that conversation came up a few times, um, but it came up more around like they don't know what they're getting into. right? <laughs> um, because they're going to think uh, just a team of girls. What do they know about games? And um, you know what? There they were um, sketching things on whiteboards and, and practicing every day. And, um, they felt like they could, they could compete. Um, I think one of the other interesting plays, because this was local based is that, um, one of the teams, uh, some of the students had actually been at the schools, uh, that we were competing against. So they were transfer students or things like that. And so there was some interesting local dynamics at play too, which I think is lost in some of the more national leagues. Okay. Uh, and I and I know you you had a little bit easier. I don't want to. I'm not trying to downplay what the work that you've done is great. I, I just want to say I think you had a little bit easier time getting some people in the door because you are working with an all girls school, so you do have a, a, a pretty solid um, underserved demographic with which you can work. But for those educators who are maybe because we talked earlier about the low hanging fruit, I guess of kids who are already there, they're already part of the gaming club. How do we reach out to those groups? that um, may be underrepresented in esports that we know these kids love the games, they love to play games. How do we get them in? How do we bring them in? I think one thing is never being satisfied with who's already in the room. And I, you know, I think surveys are great and interest level is great, but I think that you have to be asking like, who are we serving? It can't mm -hmm. just be the people who are already there. It has to be people who are not there. Why are they not there? And I think as a core um, parallel to that is that you have to be creating these safe spaces too. Um, somebody can't walk in and see nothing that represents them, nobody that looks like them, um, and say, oh, well, this is probably the place for me, right? Mm -hmm. They have to see that you understand, talk to, and are getting input from them before they're going to show up. And, and one of the groups that I've started to engage in in the Racine community, because um, while we do have some representation in our groups, in fact, our our first scholar gamer who received a scholarship is transgender, um, was, is our, is our LGBTQ plus center that we have here in Racine, actually having conversations with their leadership and their board to say, Hey, what can we do? To, because we know that your kids love playing games and we want to provide safe spaces and we want to provide opportunities, uh, for your specific group of kids, especially what can we do to provide that? What, what messaging can we do? What games can we look at? So even engaging a, a, a community organization such as that can help, or, or do you maybe have another suggestion of, of how to gauge the conversation or have the conversation? I think community partnerships and place-based partnerships are, are ideal. I think that's amazing. Um, I think that just some back to the basics things around kindness and um, open doors it goes a long way for all populations. Mm -hmm. um, I actually do some some of this work as well in the Jewish world uh, as to how to get more LGBTQIA plus folks into um, uh, into synagogues and into different congregations. And um, it's just those simple things about representation, right? Like 
Um, having a having a rainbow flag outside of your synagogue means something. Having a rainbow flag outside of your classroom means something too, right? It means that you at least know that these folks exist. Mm-hmm. Um, and when somebody walks in the door, whether they identify as this or that, um, being welcoming, saying hello, um, asking what they're interested in instead of telling them what you're interested in, I think goes a long way. And then I think that that final piece is just um, finding those populations and asking them like, some folks from them like, Hey, how come you're not here already? Because maybe there's something that's, that's off your radar. Um, that's really obvious to other folks. So, but you're never going to know unless you ask. Well, to take, and I know you're, you're relatively new into, um, the space in your school, but because you're playing non-traditional games, I believe it's uh, hearthstone was one of them. Heroes of the storm, I believe, um, rocket league. What games, what games are you, what games is your group focused on right now? Yeah, those were the three from last year, and okay. they're going to be different next year. And I think that's one of the really exciting things is that we're going to be rotating games and trying out different titles. Oh, we got, we got so many suggestions from the different students, ranging from some really intense titles all the way to golf with friends um, and uh, just dance. And we had um, some interesting uh, games that were sent to us in beta form, actually, which was an interesting idea. I mean, playing an esport title when no one has really played that game before really kind of levels the playing field and, and gets everyone started from day one and thinking like, how do I strategize around this? So, um, again, if you think of every game as a different demographic, it brings a different group of people through the door. Um, then why restrict ourselves to one or even three different games? Um, you know that there are some students out there who love playing farming simulator and there are some students out there who do not like playing farming simulator, right? I, I actually, I actually do enjoy farming simulator and it was, and I, great. it was just my one year of experience of living out in farm country and talking to farmers. And then it's like, Hey, this game came out. Oh my gosh. I can actually put into practice some of the things that I picked up from talking to these people. That's awesome. Right. But I hate to break it to you, but like, farming simulator is not going to be the one game that all schools play and everyone rallies around. Right. Oh, come so on. That's, it's not going to happen. Right. Okay. But that doesn't mean that we can't play farming simulator in schools, right? Like we can find ways to do that. Um, what it means though, is that we have to rotate we have to change games and we have to make it so that the schools are deciding those games and not the game companies. And that's, that's a hard paradigm to shift because guess what? The game companies have a lot more money than schools. And so sometimes what they say matters a little bit. And even you kind of got caught in it with uh, Heroes of the Storm where Blizzard all of a sudden says, you know, we're, we're pulling our support for this game. While the game is still out there and you can still download it, you know, even when Blizzard said we're stepping away from this one, the usership dropped tremendously, even though there was a base of people, a core base of people who are enjoying the game and playing the game. It was very easy to, for them to step away. Um even now, there's those flavors of the month games where you'll see the spike of people streaming it, say, on Twitch, and then all of a sudden they go away. Um, or let's say even politics takes a hold and and a game becomes very unpopular because of, some, like I said, some very toxic uh, public news or something comes out of it. Um, you're, you're, you're suggesting that we, we have to be able to pivot and enjoy the experience more than the game itself, I guess, right? Yeah, for sure. And I think, too, like if you're going to be committing to a a game for nine months, like if there's a bad news cycle or there's a game breaking bug or they drop support, guess what? You're almost done playing it anyways, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can continue to play it for another six months, three months, whatever it is left on your season. But if you're committing your school to playing that one game forever, um, which is what some of these schools seem to be doing, right? They're, they're creating leagues of only that game and only playing against other schools of that game, spending their summer hours practicing that game, spending their evening hours practicing that game. And suddenly there's like, I don't know, a scandal or, or a, a break or a change in licensing terms. You're stuck, right? Yeah. So those companies start asking you like, hey, guess what? Now you need to spend uh, $5,000 a year to play our game. <laughs> what are you going to do, right? Right. As soon as you back away from that, you lose all the schools that you're playing. You lose half your program. Um, it doesn't make sense. It has to be that decision and that power making authority has to stay within schools. Um, and we're at the point where it could go either way. And I'd much rather have collections of schools making those decisions than it would uh, game companies making those. No, no offense to game companies. I think they'd understand this too. It's not just schools making the decision, but um, I know that there's been a lot of for-profit companies that have, it doesn't take much to create a website, to create a leadership board, to say, hey, we want to help get you all organized. Um, 
but you know, at the, at the end of it, those, those, those groups are usually for profit. They're trying to make money. They're trying to, um, play up whatever they may with news stories or whatever. Um, I always get really wary about people who want to make money off of children. And I don't think we as educators necessarily do a good enough job of asking questions of those who come to us who have no educators as part of their leadership or who talk flippantly about developing curriculum or talking about, hey, we're trying to develop something around social emotional learning. That's great. Who worked on it with you? Who are your psychologists who helped come up with it? I think that especially now we have to be hyper vigilant about who we're doing business with in our spaces, um, more so, more so than ever. Because again, with esports, there's a lot of money potentially being made. There's a lot of exploitation, very public exploitation that can take place with children if we're not in this space. I I think there needs to be a broader conversation about educational technology, teachers, and ethics. I think that's just what it comes down to. Um, if you went to your doctor and they prescribed you a medicine. And they didn't tell you that they received a kickback every time they prescribed that medicine. You'd be really upset and Mm -hmm. you'd be really concerned about whether they had your best interests in mind. And yet time and again, we see teachers um, accepting free samples, um, accepting free software licenses um, and essentially providing that to their kids, um, to their students, to the parents, to the administrators without ever telling anyone that hey, they got this for free, or maybe they have a connection to that company or things like that. I have this conversation a lot with my students, which makes them really confused because they're like, why are you telling us that you know this person here and this person there? And I'm like, I want you to understand where this is coming from. This is your education that you know, you're know you investing in. You're spending your time, your your resources, your, your, your adolescence here with me. And if I'm giving you something that someone else has has provided to me, I want you to know that it's not just me, right? There are other influences going on here and you need to take a critical look at that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a conversation that we can have outside of games as well. Um, It affects a lot of different parts of school life. Yeah, and the the kickback part of it too is is particularly telling as, again, as companies are coming into this space, they're fighting each other. So they're looking at state level organizations, they're fighting amongst each other to get their piece of the pie. I know in Wisconsin, you know, I feel like we took a proactive step to form our own association made up of educators. We're a nonprofit status now. Uh, we've kind of laid down the gauntlet to say, here is our space that we're going to be in. And, and, and the other thing that these people are fighting over, these groups who are coming into states, kind of going against what you've done, is they're dictating what games are going to be played. They're saying these are the ones that are going to be sanctioned. Where is your perspective? You're saying, let's look more at the wants and needs of our kids and actually taking their thoughts and feedback and saying, let's make this more of a gaming experience that is competitive rather than saying a traditional esports experience focused on so many separate little titles. It, it's, yeah. it's a huge difference. It's a, it's a slight difference, but it's a major difference too when you think about it, especially like I said, when you've got groups coming into states and saying we're going to sanction these only these games here. So I guess that leads me to the next part though is – is once your children are done with high school, have you started to have any conversations with colleges about, you know, again, playing non-traditional games, non-traditional roles? Are you having conversations yet with colleges about scholarship opportunities or have you been contacted yet, especially with the story blowing up? I'm sure that it has. Has it led to conversations with colleges and higher education saying, hey, we would love to talk to some of your children about the possibility of the next level? I mean, I, I think that's something that we talk about a little bit with the students. Um, again, these students aren't looking to win the next Fortnite world cup. Mm -hmm. Um, what they are looking to do is to have successful careers. And so, um, so yeah, we, we do talk about, um, professional esports and we do talk about college scholarships, but what we really focus on are this, are those kind of socio-emotional skills, um, teamwork, leadership, perseverance, and that transcends all of these different things. So we have students who said, who have told me, you know, I'm playing this because my friends are playing games and I like hanging out with my friends. That's okay. And by the time that they graduate from college, from high school, they may not play games anymore. That's okay too. Um, but they'll remember their friendships and they'll remember the skills that they learned from that. And I have other students who are really deep into esports right now. And you know what? Some of them are interested in making their own games and that's great too. Um, mm-hmm. We have some great universities around here that support that. Um, others are looking at engineering, um, at writing. I mean, there's all kinds of different things, but what we're trying to find are the the generalized skills that are transferable that, that pop out of that um, and kind of support them based on where their interests lie. 
So you'll take the experience in the ecosystem over the championships on the shelf that when they leave the school, they walk away from what do they really gain from it? Yeah, I mean, this is insane um, what we put some of our students through because every high school football coach knows that the chances that one of their students is going to go pro and make it onto an NFL team is infinitesimal, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's just so low. And yet um, I see it uh, kind of tragically time and again, teachers holding up these streamers, many of which have some character and more morality issues of their own. Um, and they'll hold up these streamers, uh, potentially not as great role models and say like, look, you could make $3 million. Like that's not the message that the kids need to be hearing right now. What they need to be hearing is that, Hey, look around you in your classroom. Like what can you do here? What can you do in your community? Um, let's focus less on that and more about how esports can be a ramp to other experiences. So crazy question. Um, and, I, and I'll just throw this at you. This is an idea I've kind of been kicking around for some time, but uh, people talk about Hogwarts University as being, or Hogwarts school as being the school of wizardry. Um, obviously there's schools around the United States devoted to the arts, devoted to music, to dance. Is it crazy to say, let's do an esports uh, esports school? I, I think one exists. Um, if I'm not wrong, I think it's in New Zealand. And I think they spend um, pretty much, uh, I think it might be a boarding school. And they spend most of their days um, uh, drilling on esports. And it's connected to a bunch of other academic domains. I haven't visited there. I can't vouch for it or, or criticize it really because I don't know enough about their program. Um, I think that there's a place for that. I think Interlochen serves as an example for what, like, you know, an intense art school experience that's a boarding school um, looks like. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think there will always be uh, that on the end, edges of that bell curve. There will be people who are interested in that and it might be the perfect fit for um, personally for me right now. I'm more interested on the, the bigger part of the bell and like what does it mean to increase games and playful activities in school, um, both through esports and through other other forms of learning as well. Well, we know that the importance of play can lead to so many different things. And, Jay, I am so appreciative of your time and you being able to share with us a little bit more of the story that you have to share. I will put in the show notes a link to the New York Times article, Associated Press, it printed in New York Times, of course. And I hope you got, I hope you found a copy of the New York Times and cut that out and put it into a nice framed thing. It's kind of a cool thing to have when you got the New York Times or a Wall Street Journal. Um, but where else can people learn more about the work that you're doing, about Hathaway Brown? What, where else can they connect? Yeah, I mean, you can learn all about it. Hathaway Brown um, at hb.edu, and we're on Twitter and Instagram as well. Um, for myself, I'm actually going to be going to a number of conferences throughout the year. Throughout the year, so hopefully I'll see folks there. And um, I have to give a plug: like anyone who's in Cleveland, you know, shoot me an email. I'm always happy to to host and uh, meet up for conversations. We'll actually be hosting the um, Northeast Ohio uh, STEM ecosystem convening here in October, um, which is about a place-based approach to improving STEM in communities. So um, we'd, we'd love to see that. Um, there'll also be another podcast that was done with their students during the championship that's going to be released in the next month or two. Um, that's through one of our sponsors, iThrive Foundation, which looks at connections between social emotional learning and games. Um, so hopefully we'll have that link for you as well, soon as well, where you can actually hear from some of the students. Perfect. Jay Collins, thank you so much for your time. Yep, thanks Thanks again. And um, like I said, stop by if you're, you're ever in Cleveland. That will do it for this week on the Academy of Esports. I've been your host, James O'Hagan. Esports are organized competitive video games allowing schools to redefine their athletic culture, diversify opportunities for student participation, promote good physical and mental health, increase collegiate scholarship pathways, and play games. We can never forget the importance of play. The mission of the Academy of Esports is to support these ideals. The vision of the Academy of Esports is for all students to experience the fun and joy of playing competitive video games. You may follow me on Twitter at Jim O'Hagan. That's at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N and through the Academy of Esports account at T-A-O Esports it's a great way to get the latest blog posts, podcast episodes, and news coming out of esports and education. And remember, you can continue your engagement by going to www.taoesports.com. You can also connect through Facebook at 
www.facebook.com slash TAO Esports. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to our time again next week.